Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Lawrence Samuels, the author of Killing History, uh, a, uh, The False Left-Right Political Spectrum, Jason McPhee, who is an uh, engineer for the state of California, and Philip Larea, who is a, a poet and the uh, uh, editor of Minute Dot, which is about investment advice. And uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, we, we revisit the, the uh, issue of guns being used to kill people in spectacular ways every, it seems like clockwork, every you know, three or four months or sometimes even more, more frequently. Uh, somebody gets it into their head to go, you know, to, go to a, a mall or go to a garlic festival or go to uh, um, wherever and just start shooting at people randomly. The, most, the two most recent ones were uh, in El Paso and in Dayton. The guy in El Paso was an alleged, uh, self-proclaimed, actually, uh, white supremacist, is my understanding. And the guy in Dayton was a supporter of Antifa. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we sliding into political violence where, uh, where, where amateurs are taking over the role of government in starting wars? Well, the, uh, the interesting, especially about Antifa being the antithesis of white supremacists, uh, is that it doesn't matter, it's not a matter of philosophy. You're not a conservative or a liberal doing this. You are inclined to do it. And I think what it really goes to, uh, it, it's not the issue of the gun, because, you know, if not the gun, take away all the guns, it'll be bombs. Take away the bombs, it'll be chemicals. It'll be it's, knives. That can be knives. People kill by knives. Uh, and, you know, uh, it rifles. just, uh, and so we always talk about guns. And it seems to me that uh, obviously the social issue is why do we have these people who are so disaffected that they want to commit a crime like that? Uh, and that's the heart of it. But. Uh, then it goes to, then we, uh, invariably that goes to this issue of gun regulation is, you know, is there a, a way to, you know, take the guns away from the bad people but not the good people, etc. And, um, you know, we just have to remember that the Second Amendment was, exists specifically so that civilians will not be disarmed by an oppressive government. How, and for no other reason. It's not no about Bambi. Yeah. Yeah, and so how that. do you create any kind of background check as long as government is at the back end of that background check that is in any way sensible? I know people, they're worried about the, uh, the killings, like 17 and uh, students and was it Parkland and, you know, and 10 here, that. But they don't realize what happened in the 20th century. No one talks about the 272 people murdered by their own government. In fact, actually, that's the lower end from Dr. Rumble. Uh, it's up to, up to 400 million uh, people who didn't have rights to guns, couldn't defend themselves, went to gulags, got, uh, you know, uh, genocide, I don't know, and we're thinking about that. Almost half a billion people died by their own government, and they didn't have guns. Well, and as it happens, they've kept the statistics, and you go back to the 19th century when everybody had a gun, you know, going back to the West and uh, all that kind of thing, the crime rate was much, much lower than it is. You know, if a guy stole your horse, you killed him. And, you know, you didn't have so many horse thieves, or they hung him. And well, yeah, so but hopefully they like, had some due process. But the, <laughs> the, threat, the threat of the individual being armed is, you know, the, the greatest deterrent to... A criminal, a true, you know, uh, a true criminal, arming themselves and shooting people well, up. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the bottom line is you have to keep guns out of the hands of sociopaths. Yes. Where do you find the most sociopaths? You find them running and getting elected to public <laughs> office. Yes. Politics. Uh, and the, the record of the 20th century, as you alluded, the Rommel facts, uh, statistics are that individuals kill millions of people, millions, and that's horrible. But governments kill hundreds of millions yeah, of hundreds people. Of millions, hundreds, hundreds of millions. Hundreds of, of people. millions of people. And they're all defenseless. Whereas, yeah. where you know, yeah. it's 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 just uh, it's just an order of magnitude worse. If those and you can't red flagging people. You can't you can't have those hundreds of millions killed with an armed populace. It won't happen. You you, you know, mm -hmm. if the Jews during the Holocaust or before it had guns, there wouldn't have been a Holocaust. You know, the Warsaw riot uh, uh, by the Jews. They had originally five guns, and they, were, and they got more as they killed off the Nazis, National Socialists. But uh, they, two divisions had to come 
They, you know, Germany had to spare two divisions to go after him with people who had only five guns in the beginning. Well, and obviously, uh, the American Revolution doesn't happen unless the civilians are armed. You know, Washington's army was never much more than 6,000 people, and all of them came with their muskets. And, uh, you know, there was American, the American, the colonies had no, um, had no way to build guns, and certainly not at the rate that the British could bring them. So there is no American Revolution, there is no America without the Second Amendment. Uh, and there is no way that you can say this person is a red, that government can say this <coughs> person is a red flag. We think this person is dangerous. Where does that slippery slope go? Well, it's in our history, because Lexington Concord, the British were going there to uh, Massachusetts, out in the countryside, to take away the guns and the ammo, and actually even some cannons, which they did have. They, they were looking for those too. And that's why we're so much into gun rights, because the British were trying to take away from the colonists. Okay, so, but now we're looking at, I mean, uh, Trump ran with the support of the NRA and the you know, pro-Second Amendment people. He's now talking about red flag laws. So was Mitch McConnell, uh, and the Democrats are just jumping all over, jumping with glee at the opportunity to get the gun control that they have so uh, sorely wanted for, for, for decades. Is there any hope that, we, that, that, the, uh, that the Second Amendment will hold? I mean, there's a couple of cases going possibly going to the Supreme Court. Is there a possibility that uh, the, uh, the socialist fascists will, uh, on guns will win? That's a good uh, chance. You know, the Second They're, Amendment has stood the test of time. Yeah, I'm but they could pack the Supreme Court, they can get new people in there. Eventually it's gonna go by. Still, by. the Supreme Court now, right now, is uh, you know, considered more, um, That's we use words that don't matter, uh, yeah. it would be considered more- uh, uh, Classical liberal. More classical liberal. More, classical liberal. Uh, more uh, sympathetic to the Second Amendment. Uh, and so at least if it goes that far, and I don't see how they could craft a law that does not violate the Second Amendment. I don't see how you could do well, that. Well, you get to a point, you have laws where it makes it impossible to buy a gun or use a gun. Or, or, you know, they'll or, find you know, some the, way. The license the ammunition. You know, or, you know, the, or, the, the attorneys tried that, will find talking about taxing yeah. the ammunition. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, well, in California, uh, that's, what, that's what they're doing. In fact, yeah. it's almost impossible to buy, like Sun says, impossible, almost impossible to buy ammunition in California now. Mm -hmm the way it had been set up. But I think, yeah, eventually, you know, all civilizations has their golden periods, and it's downhill after that. You know, and they keep increasing the regulations, the taxes. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to be another uh, Roman empire that's going to fall. But you know what gets kind of disturbing about all this and what's triggering these uh, new requests for gun laws is, is, is the fact that I think there's just this, this lack of civility that is just being amplified right now. I mean, you know, literally people on each side now are not seeing the other side as having as being you know, say good people with just different ideas. I mean, they're really seeing them as bad people. Hence, you know, the the constant reaching for, you know, racist and um, you know any other uh, type of ad hominem that you can throw at somebody instead of actually having a discussion. Yeah, I mean, you know, right so, now today everybody's a racist. Doesn't matter. Sure. Pelosi been considered a racist now, and who, who else? Uh, Biden a racist. Everybody's a racist. Sure. So. You know, uh, it doesn't mean anything more. It's like sure. the word fascism. Sure. Orwell in the 40s said fascism has no meaning anymore. Well, and, and just like the, the Antifa people being anti-fascist and they're well, yeah, but they are. very they're fascist. fascist. <laughs> they are. Well, historically, so, that's who yeah. joined them in, in yeah. Italy was the black shirts of Mussolini. They came in and joined the groups and because they're, the, the historians say, because they're so similar in ideology. Part of the problem, though, is the fact is, we, you know, we've, we've talked before about the financialization of the economy and the uh, the uh, disparity between uh, income levels of you know the top one percent and the uh, and the rest of us, basically due to Fed policy or mismanagement of the economy, that's creating a homeless homelessness problem, particularly <coughs> well in, 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 in most large cities, and we're seeing it here in Sacramento. We're seeing uh, huge numbers of people sleeping on the streets, uh, you know, on the sidewalks, wherever. Uh, the uh, the answer by the city fathers is to build homeless shelters here and there and wherever they're they're not wanted. What is the short term and the long term solution to homelessness? Well, as far as the the homelessness in general, I mean, one of the biggest problems is just getting a handle on on the numbers and what's happening. I mean, this is a hard population to count and keep track of. Um, you know, the uh, HUD keeps a report that they put out every year that they try to track this stuff nationally. Um, not. Too surprisingly, it's a bigger problem in blue states than the red states, but uh, it, you know, and that's kind of exemplified by this recent report in Sacramento that said that homelessness has gone up 20% over the last year in Sacramento. So it's you know the policies, 
you know, it's, it's hard to say exactly, you know, it, why all the issues, but certainly you have distortion upon distortion upon distortion. You have all kinds of issues, uh, you know, of, of keeping people from, from building in a lot of these uh, blue state cities, you know, a lot of building codes in San Francisco where the problem is one of the worst. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a tough nut to crack. I, I think if we go toward more free market, even though a lot of them don't want to hear that, you know, that's probably going to help the problem out a lot more to bring housing prices down and to, you know, um, alleviating at least some of the problems. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, I think there's at least three uh, components to the problem. You mentioned one, which is zoning and regulatory laws making housing extremely uh, expensive, um, uh, something like 50% of the cost of a new home, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, goes into basically taxes and fees. How much? 50%, maybe more, I'm not sure. Uh, a huge well, percentage. Uh, well, licenses. I mean, they had a house recently in uh, San Jose, and it was almost 100000 in fees uh, to uh, to uh, get it to be built. Yeah. Just, uh, so, but uh, yeah, a very large percentage yeah. of the cost of a new home uh, it goes to the government and, you know, for building permits and fees and so forth and so on. Property taxes are high even with, even with, uh, uh, with the, uh, Prop, with the 13. Prop, Prop 13. That's so, so the cost of housing is artificially high due to government regulation of one form or another. The second thing is our incomes are artificially low because of licensing laws, because of minimum wage laws. Minimum wage laws keep, keep uh, earnings low. They, they make it possible for people that are you know, about five steps up the, the ladder well. to make a little bit more money. But people that are in the first two or three steps don't make any money at all. Uh, with, min with minimum wage laws. So minimum wage laws keep people from earning money. Uh, so you've got, and, and then licensing laws for, for occupational licensing laws. If you want to practice your profession, you have to essence, essentially get permission from the government. The government. Uh, to government. Bring a you know, I, I, I would add yeah. one more thing, uh, just to you know, walk in the streets, and maybe this is more of the poet than the financial guy. Uh, I think that our society has become so complex and that we have to work interface with government, most of us, you know, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on an annual basis, and the stress of that, you know, pay, just paying the bills, kind of, you know, half of that stuff. What I see of the homeless, one, that they've been criminalized at some point in their life for mm, some yes. sort of consensual act, often. There are sort of civilian PTSD people that they come back to this society and they can't live in it, and they don't want to live in it. They don't want all of the burden of it. And that on the other side of that, there is this kind of passive resentment by those who say, I'm going through all of this. I put up with all this nonsense. You're supposed to want it. And by God, you're going to be punished for not wanting it because unless we all play, we all suffer. Well, and then there's, and there's a fourth thing that, that, that uh, leads to homelessness, and that's drug use. Yeah. And of course, drug use is encouraged and amplified by anti-drug laws. Uh, it's counterintuitive, but it's but it's true. The more that you have drugs available on the black market rather than a legitimate market, the more the opportunity for those drugs to be adulterated, for them to be uh, uh, not what you think you're getting, uh, and and to be uh, stronger. Any number of things can go wrong. They can get people addicted much more yeah. rapidly. There is a program in Switzerland. I think uh, Judge Jim uh, Gray talks about a lot. In Switzerland, they actually have clinics where you can get free heroin, but you have to come in, see a doctor, and they'll maybe prescribe something to get off of it, but you can get it for free. And that's put a lot of the drug dealers out of business mm -hmm. because you can just go down there, you know, get a doctor examination, and, and actually they did it in a few cities, and then they put it on the ballot a few years ago, and it won. <laughs> what was interesting is on that same ballot was legalized marijuana. That lost, but the heroin <laughs> won. <laughs> Live it to the Swiss. Well, Portugal is another is another country that's legalized drugs, and their drug problem has has essentially evaporated. Same way with Holland. But this, this is part of the issue too. Once you criminalize the user, then the user is not going to be able to one make sure the quality that they're getting. They they won't be able to get themselves examined for any mental illness that might be causing them. I mean, because you know yeah. some of these people are being yeah. And with, and with a criminal record, they're not going to get a job. Exactly. Uh, it's yes. much, much more yeah. difficult to get a job. So yeah. I mean, we've got all kinds of peripheral uh, factors that are causing the homelessness and, and you know and then try to build a tiny home yeah can't do it codes <laughs> oh there's so many codes well you know just on that one house in 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 san jose having about 
you know, 100,000 in fees. I think it took a year or something like that. But in my area, when they want to do a, you know, more than just one house, a, de a development, maybe, you know, 50 homes or condo, something like that, it keeps getting sued because you can make money off of this, yeah, you know? Yeah. A lot of times they'll throw money at you to go away, and other times, uh, anyway, it could take 20 years. There's one ne next to me. It took tw 20, 25 years for them to actually get approval that it do, do EP, uh, EPA reports and over and over again, this, and sued, and that kind of, I mean, it's just, that's a lot of cost. Those homes are, instead of being, you know, maybe in a 700,000 range, because, you know, they're, you know, maybe an acre, or two, or three, uh, they're probably going to be three or four million. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in, my, in, in, in my town, in Davis, you, you have to get, you have to go on the ballot and win a win a win an election if you want if you're a developer and you want to build homes, and so they advertise homes for sale. Some you know some developers you know run the run the run the uh, the uh, the obstacle course and, and and you know get their development approved and advertise you know very very inexpensive homes in the eight hundred thousand dollar range. Yeah, right. So. Um, <laughs> Oh no! I, I, well, and, and homeless people should buy them. What the heck? You know. <laughs> well, another reason this one was so expensive it was like a thousand acres, and most of it's going to be preserved. Only about eight. There's going to yeah, be only yeah. like 80, 100 homes there, and you know, it had trails going here and there. But even with that, it took them twenty years. We're in an era where uh, politicians are starting to shame the uh, their, their opponents. Uh, by or, or shame the backers, the donors to their opponents, uh, by publicizing that, that, they're, that they're donors. We have, I, I think, a, a guy in was it Beto O'Rourke was doing that, or somebody else. Uh, yeah, there, there was a. There's been a few cases. One, uh, I guess the uh, the owner of the Miami Dolphins. Uh, uh, you know, he's a Trump supporter, and you know, he was, you know, being put out that he was, you know, uh, funding some of these, uh, you know, Trump rallies or something that. And so then, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't going to go to his, uh, what do they call it, um, soul, uh, soul Cycle, I guess it is, you know, his, his gyms, that because, or I guess the gyms that sell the equipment that he's just a stockholder and it's funny, he doesn't even own the company, he's just a major stockholder in it and so now suddenly people aren't going. But it's, it's funny, it, it goes back to this incivility that, you know, we, we're having in the country where, you know, if we don't see the other side as necessarily decent people with just different ideas, they're the enemy. And, and my gosh, if they have a different idea than you, you better make sure everybody knows and, and you know, send their address out and let the people show up at their house and threaten them. And you know, it, it, Harry Brown, the candidate for president, libertarian candidate for president back in the 90s, he said the campaign contributions should be private. People should not, you know, should be able to donate privately. Uh, their name's not known. Uh, Interesting idea. What do you think? Well, you know, uh, I, I think you've got a wonderful point, uh, Jason. It's, it's the incivility. It's the intolerance. And that intolerance is not necessarily, and this goes back to your, your point about how, lang how the language has been so distorted that we use the, li the word liberal to describe intolerance, to describe violence, to describe a sort of a vicious kind of collectivism yeah. where the individual is simply not allowed to exist. Yeah. So what, where did we see in the 2016 campaign where all the violence came from? It came mostly from the Sanders people. If you think back on the days of the baseball bats and all of that. And so ob oddly enough, it is this progressivism which is the more accurate yes. term, or collectivism, but yeah. politically we would call it progressivism. That is the most intolerant and oh, tends it is the first, uh, the first one with Wilson, the biggest segregationist, and you know, our Harris, a president, uh, glorifying the Ku Klux Klan, President Wilson. I mean, it's amazing. They put the 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 uh, se uh, segregated uh, the the federal government. They uh, except some blacks they needed, so they put them in cages. They come in from work, lock the gate, you know, and he'd work. And I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, some people actually consider Wilson the, the first uh, fascist. Uh, well, he was uh, he, American. No, no, he was a, he, he he was fired, a progressive. He fired all the black workers. Exactly. On his very first. No, day. He, yeah, he was a progressive. Did. Yeah, he's a progressive. He was, he was a progressive. And what's interesting when you read about because I got in my chapter five on on this thing. I mean, they still consider him a progressive. They still consider him the, one of the first modern liberals. And, and, and he was allowing lynching to go down in the South. He wouldn't do anything about the lynching. And, uh, you know, he gun both uh, diplomacy. Gun he thousands of people arrested and put in jail for, for anti-war demonstrations. <laughs> Come on, the Democrat Party. <laughs> oh, wait, I can't do that. Right. <laughs> the Democrat Party is the ugliest uh, party Let's talk ever. about Democratic Socialist Convention where they are making 
uh, making uh, make way for jazz hands. You yeah, can't clap. Jazz hands. <laughs> I, I'm I'm totally triggered by what you just said. <laughs> no, I, no, I like it. I, well, I like to somebody sounding. explain this thing to me. Well, so the Democratic Socialists recently had a uh, convention, and it's been making its way around the news and, and online and social media. But it, it was uh, it was really surreal. I mean, they get the guy starts out with his comments to the audience, telling them how. You know, there's there could be infiltrators out there, so don't talk to anybody except you know uh, people with badges that you know, so we know Whoa, who we are. Oh, and then they go on and they they talk about okay, we're not going to clap now because that might trigger people. And then people started saying, hey, people are making noises and have offensive odors, and it just de Whoa. devolved into some kind of a, a very strange. Uh, it almost seemed like an episode of South Park. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you look at the history of like this, these various socialist yeah. parties, they've been split. I don't know how many times, like four or yeah. five, six, seven, eight times. They split. One goes this way, because you can't seem to stand each other. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, you know, I can understand uh, that. Yeah, yeah. You, you think the about body so, that term "social justice warriors" and that kind of thing? It almost always refers to somebody, you know, doing violence to somebody. Uh, and you think about, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Thoreau is uh, related to the the socialist says, uh, he said, if I knew someone was coming to my house to do me good, I would run out the back door there as fast go. as I could. <laughs> I like that one. I don't know if I've seen that one. Well, you, you know what was so ironic about this group, though, is when they were sitting there giving their warnings to the group, thinking they were going to be sabotaged from outside the group, they're putting this stuff out to the entire world. And, I mean, they're, they're saying things like, hey, guys, we need to do this. And then somebody will say, you shouldn't use gendered language. <laughs> I mean, it just, it was amazing. I mean, one thing after another, another where they were just kind of self-destructing in front yeah, of everybody. Yeah. Like the deer, <laughs> you know, frozen in the headlines, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, no, no. It's, 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 a, it's a strange, strange world. Uh, uh, but, you know, I mean, you go back to the fascist Marxists. I mean, Hitler was a social uh, uh, justice person. He had a number of speeches. You can't have, in 1920, you can't have... Uh, a healthy state without internal social justice. Mussolini said he's going to impose social justice on Italy. I mean, their posters are that way, their speeches that way, and, and also the neo-Nazis in America in the 30s had a publication called Social Justice. Hmm. Yeah. So and well, and a lot of the... A lot of the anti-immigration uh, well, uh, you know, rhetoric is about social justice for citizens. They have a, you know, us, us, you know, people were born here, you know, and how they're, they're coming to take our jobs, and that's not just or something. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah, okay. Um, in fact, it's so triggering that uh, Hollywood has been triggered. Hollywood has been triggered uh, by, by Trump so much that they have decided not to release a movie that's already been produced. It's called The Hunt. Why? Why? Try to uh, try to shame and uh, and make uh, uh, make uh, the, uh, their opponents fearful of them. You know what happened if they did that to? Uh, okay. Oh, we're going to we're going to target what, blacks. We're going to target was, Jews. What, give, well, us the back, give us the background. What's the, what's this? Well, the, the movie, movie about? is targeting uh, con conservatives. They're they're uh, uh, putting them out in the field and they're hunting them like they're uh, wild animals. Oh, okay, so this is this is. Uh, a, a, an apocalyptic uh, film about liberals hunting conservatives down? In, oh, in, in, I hate to say the word liberal. Uh, status left is hunting okay, down uh, uh, conservatives. You know, uh, uh, they have the guns, uh, the conservatives don't. They have to flee, find yeah. any way they can to protect themselves. Uh, and uh, of course, who, they, so who's the good guy in this movie? Anybody? Well, uh, the guys with the guns. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, what actually, actually, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's, it's funny, actually, that's part of the irony of this whole thing is that at least from what I've heard about the story, is that, uh, you know, some of the uh, conservatives who are being chased actually figure out some way to fight back. And so they're kind of portrayed as the heroes in a way. So it, it kind of is, it's a very strange, oddball thing. And it's, it, it's but it really... Well, it's, it's very odd. Yeah. That, I mean, we think of, um, you know, we're trying to figure out terms to use, but I think... <laughs> It's very odd that the movie should portray the progressives as the aggressors <laughs> with the guns. <laughs> And the people who are, we would call individualists, we would call classical liberals, uh, who are the people that are being hunted down. 
And, and the conservatives are the ones that are getting pissed off. What? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The conservatives want to silence them. Maybe, maybe it's really a comedy, but it looks like it may not come out. But uh, yeah. but I would like to see what their what their motive was and everything. And that's not out yet, so we can only speculate. But you know what? You don't have to watch you know Hollywood creations in order to find entertainment on the, <laughs> on the screen. All you have to do is watch uh, YouTube and other videos of Democratic candidates. In particular, Yang and his ad hominem on Trump. That was actually kind of surprising to me. I, I, you know, I've been really hoping for some civility, and, and maybe that last movie we were talking about was a commentary on this lack of civility that we're going toward. But um, Yang was impressing me as one of the most civil of the candidates. And even though I don't completely, you know, I'm, I'm not completely on board with his universal basic income, I think it's a, it's a good discussion to have. It's an interesting debate and he seems to be taking the high road and then the other day he was uh, in an interview and he started calling Trump a fat slob and saying that um, he could beat him in a push-up contest and boy he everybody would love to see Trump pass out if they both ran a mile and he'd beat him and, and it just struck me Yang is 44 years old Trump is 71 years old, old and he's challenging him to you know physical feats and I, I just you know, and that it really let me down on Yang because he was somebody I was hoping, at the very least, would introduce some civility on the Democrat side, and maybe he'll, you know, maybe his handlers will get a hold of him and, and <laughs> kind of. <laughs> you know. yeah, yeah. If he needs handlers to rein him in, he's not worth. Maybe that so. Way. Maybe he got too much caffeine that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they're trying to steal a page out of uh, uh, Trump's playbook back in the election, where you know, be the interesting guy, be the guy they talk about. And, you know, Yang was, you know, more of a, of a scholarly type or, you know, an intellectual type. And that just doesn't get ratings. You know, what you want to do is say that guy's so fat. You know, your, your mama is so fat. He <laughs> can't, you know, in the hot air balloon. She wears army off, boots. You know? <laughs> but this was the sad thing is that Yang was one of the first of that lower rung to make the cut for the next debate. So he was starting to, to surge up and then... You know, boom, you know, it's an incivility explosion, I guess. And I, you know, I mean, maybe he thinks that's just the way he has to confront Trump. I don't know. But boy, it was, it was if you go to watch the interview online, it's, it's about seven, six, seven minutes of kind of painful listening to him go on and on about how fat Trump is and how massive Trump is. <laughs> And, and, and he can run from this from this video, but he can't yeah. hide because <laughs> Amazon has recognition facial software that can spot fear. Spot fear? I'm afraid. No. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I never tire of bashing Amazon. <laughs> um, you know, Amazon people think it's a retail company. It, it, its business is its retail business is completely is not profitable. Amazon's business is valued on this one little piece, and it's a government piece, and it has to do with selling data. And that's all in the cloud. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thanks for being part of the show.